if you like betting on golf, but everyone that your back misses the cut, get some experts involved, with all the stats and the tips and so much more, cause it's the golf betting system, the golf betting system, it's the golf betting system. Greetings and welcome to the Golf Bank System Podcast 174. This is our 2021 Open Championship In-Depth Research Podcast. Paul Williams and Barry O'Hattenham join me, Steve Bamford, to discuss the 2021 Open Championship. Good morning, gents. Morning, guys. Good morning. This podcast is for listeners of 18 and above. Please be gamble aware. You can visit begambleaware.org for more info. And of course, please bet responsibly. Visit our world famous golf betting system website with our in depth betting previews, masses of tournament stats, and our predictor models all available completely free of charge with no paywall. Please subscribe to this podcast and drive the popularity of the show. We're available on Twitter. Paul is at golf betting. I'm at Bamford Golf. Barry is at a good talk golf. You can join our Golf Betting System Facebook group. The link is available in the description box. There'll be plenty of open championship banter on there. Plus, look out for the Steve Bamford Golf YouTube channel where I present the Golf Betting Show every week. Now, you guys as listeners power this podcast. You power the podcast. So we need your five-star reviews on Apple Podcasts as ever. For those of you who leave a review, I will read them out at the start of a future show. Leave your name and where you are in the review. Of course, if you can get... A review to us in the next couple of days. We will read them out on the Open Championship podcast, which we will record next Tuesday. That was always, and I mean always, the biggest podcast of the year. Just in terms of our uh, chart here, we've got 147 reviews so far from UK and Ireland. Leading the way, 126 in America. We've got 23 in Australia. So if you're in Australia or the United States, please send us a five-star review. We will read them out at the start of the Open, of course. And if you fancy doing it in the UK and Ireland, that would be just fine. Maybe we can extend the lead. Right. I've got one here. Great podcast. Five stars. I must listen before making my picks for the week, just based on info and knowledge. But also a good group of guys with some great humour. And that is Kissy Boy 99 and he is in Canada. Thank you, Kissy. Lovely stuff. Was he saying that we're a bunch of bunch of jokers, Steve? Is that the uh, is, is that the sentiment? Great humour. Can, pl- can we do plus points for the year on that then? Plus points humour <laughs> rather than plus points. Maybe betting. we should. Have, maybe we should have <laughs> a humour profit and loss. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, it'd be better than my tipping profit and loss. I know that. So you know, I've actually got a couple in the mix this week in the John Deere lottery. So. We'll see how that pans out over the next fifty-four <laughs> holes. Right, let's let's forget about all that rubbish. Let's let's really hone down on this Open Championship that uh, is being played next week. Um, I know we, none of us have got tickets, but uh, Paul and I have booked a trip into London next Thursday. We're going into the big smoke, and Paul and I could be playing the Open because we're going to one of these um, indoor golf centres. Where hopefully we can play a bit of golf on a on a course of our choice, a, a famous course, and we can have a few beverages while we're uh, watching the first round of the Open. Perhaps it'll improve our uh, our game, Steve. If we uh, well after last Friday, the way you annihilated me, um, <laughs> I hope it doesn't improve your game. <laughs> um, my my game it. was absolutely terrible last week, but but the. We're, we're clearly playing Sandwich. It's a bit of a strange one, isn't it? Because this was meant to be the 2020 Open. Now, of course, it's 2021. It's a bit of a hybrid. The field's a bit of a hybrid. We've already got a few names disappearing off the off the list in terms of players not coming across from America. Um, Siwoo Kim's injured. Sung Jae Im as we, isn't going to play. Kevin Nas decided not to wear his bobble hat over here, which is always a... I always like to see Kevin Nas in his bobble hat. That's not happening either. So... It's a bit of a fluid field, but um, clearly that will all start to confirm itself over the next few days. The golf course itself, though, it is a course that we've been to, Paul, isn't it? We we did venture down to Sandwich in 2012. Or, no, 2011, wasn't it? 2011. Mm-hmm. I, re- I remember it well. Um, 
in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, long, walk, in, long old walk from the uh, train station, as I train, If you could call it a train station, it was like <laughs> literally a field and a bit of wooden decking. Uh, and yeah, middle of nowhere. It, the, the thing I always remember about it before we got horribly um, inebriated was the fact that it was so open, so desolate, and the sand dunes were just monstrous. What, what, what do you remember of your time at Sandwich? Yeah, it's just, it's a proper links, isn't it? That's yeah. <laughs> essentially you're walking around, and it, it's none of this manufactured malarkey. It's um, it, it's the real deal. And when the conditions, as they did that year, turn, it yeah. it, it can create a proper uh, test. And uh, I, as ever, these links tracks are only as only as tough as the conditions, aren't they? And yeah, when it when it's dry or when it's windy, when it's rainy, I think it brings a number of uh, kind of old heads to the to the table to the to the equation. To you know, the, the, the experienced players can really really start to um, to to come to the fore. I'm not sure we're going to get that this year. I mean, we can go through the weather in a few few minutes, but um, if the conditions are soft, if the conditions are benign, then um, these courses still are there for the taking. So. So that would be interesting. And, and again, we're a week out, so it's always difficult to draw firm conclusions as to what you should expect. But um, I guess, you know, we always tend to prefer to see an open where, you know, maybe single digits under pass, four, four six, eight is winning. But I'm not convinced you're going to get that this year. I think you're going to see something that's far more deeper in terms of the scoring, which, which will be a shame for the course because I think the course holds up extremely well to tough conditions and uh, lends itself to a, a, a trickier test. I don't, I don't think we're going to, um, it's going to take anything away from it because it's, it's a links course. It's going to play tricky. Even if the leaders are able to score well in it, you're still going to see plenty of disasters and struggles from players. So, you know, and if it can, as long as it can separate the field a bit and and you know show who's playing the best golf of the week or who are you know the top contenders of the week then it doesn't really matter whether it's you know they're 15, 10 12 under par or you know 1 2 under par i mean the you remember when stenson won i mean stenson and phil were miles under par and it took nothing away from it. It was extremely exciting. Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, an incredible final day. Yeah, it's um, yeah, it, was, it was just a different open, wasn't it? In the, in the respect that it mm. was far more scorable then, and uh, kind of not what you would um, you'd expect. But you know, we, we can't change conditions. We can't change the uh, the, the, the you know the light yeah. of uh, wind or rain or or dry summery conditions, which um, if we get in the UK are usually fleeting and uh, and very short lived. But uh, mm. perhaps we'll I'll make a sh- that, so. I'm going to make a prediction. Masters ten under par, PGA Championship six under par, US Open six under par. I think that the Open will be double digits under par to the winner. Yeah. It'll, be the, I mean, the it'll thing... be to par the easiest of the four majors this year, just based on the, yeah. the course conditions that we know. You know, we, we can go into that in a slightly more detail, and also just I just don't think the wind's going to be at that that velocity where it's causing major headaches. No. Ah, we'll see. We'll see. Like we're a week away from weather mm. happening in this part of the world, and it can change like at the snap of a finger. So uh, the other thing to bear in mind is that the UK Fire Service their their hoses are nowhere near as powerful as the US Fire <laughs> Service. So you know, if there's a bit 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 of uh, dryness over the coming days to keep that course firm yeah. and fiery, um, add in even even something as light as like six, seven, eight. To ten miles an hour winds yeah. out there, and a firm fast course, it starts to play havoc. Paul mentioned ten to fifteen. I'm just looking at an early wind finder here. I think, yeah, Friday, Friday could ten be int- Friday could be interesting. It's saying ten, up to twenty, yeah. which that would start to become meaningful, seriously uh, meaningful. Listen, ten, ten to fifteen when you're at the coast, like the wind has just a bit mm. more weight to it, no matter what the wind speed is, or as I say, it always has a bit more torque. So. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to get bogged down in score predictions here. No. I mean, it's um, you know, there's only one, there's only one uh, open in the under or in the plus minus par era that's got into double digits here at Sandwich, and that was Greg Norman in '93. Like the last two, uh, the last two that were here, Ben Curtis won at one under par, and uh, Darren Clark won at five under par. Now those were uh, different pars for the course, but. 
Yeah, but then you had Greg Norman winning at 13 under in 93. Yeah. When it was benign. So anyway, the the, the steer I've got for listeners, Paul Larson on Twitter. That's where you that's who you need to be following. Effectively, he's the head greenkeeper at Royal St George's. So it's at capital P Paul Capital L Larson L A R S E N then capitals R S G. Follow him on Twitter because um I've been following him for about four months. I know Paul's been following him now for a, a good three to four weeks. I mean, Nick Faldo was on the course on the uh, 7th of July. You get all this information. But it just basically, he's constantly taking and giving updates about, on every day, what the ground crew are up to, what the condition of the course is. He answers questions as well. So people have already asked him about, um, you know, how, are you happy with the, the ground conditions, the softness of the course? He actually said the other day, Paul, didn't he, that he would like it firmer. Yeah, I mean, it has been quite wet over here in uh, yeah. England over the last couple of months, and uh, you know, Kent hasn't um, escaped that. So it's softer than than they would that he would like, than you know, yeah. the ground staff would like. And uh, if if you combine a softish course, and uh, you know, from what I'm seeing in the forecast, we're likely to see um, the chance of rain all the way up until Thursday. Um, you combine a softish course with relatively light winds, and notwithstanding what Barry said, and I, I, I do agree, I do tend to agree that uh, any wind gets exacerbated by the coast. But um, I, yeah, it, it still feels to me that it won't be a, a Darren Clark style tough Open Championship this year. It will be it will be closer to the Greg Norman style. Would be my assumption on the uh, on the conditions. Paul Larson is like he's probably one of the people who is most enjoying Twitter at the moment. Mm. Re- oh. A really good follow. Yeah, I like his rock star hair. <laughs> he describes himself as a Robert Smith of the golf world. <laughs> nice. He, he looks like a decent chap, doesn't he? And uh, he's he's uh, he's a definite follow. So, if, listeners, if you want to get bang up to speed with how the course is and how it's going to play. And just uh, get plenty of decent visuals of the golf course. Um, that follow on Twitter, absolutely um, essential. So, what do we face here? Let's have a quick look at Royal St George's. Um, a quick kind of overview. Um, as Paul said, a true classical links test. It actually held the first Open held on English soil back in eighteen ninety four. That kind of gives you the heritage that we're dealing with. Um, interesting here in terms of winners, we have had a mix. Uh, Greg Norman is the only golfer around here to have recorded a score that was actually double digits under par. And that was 13 under 267 in 1993. I don't, I, that to me feels kind of right actually. Maybe 13, 15. That's my gut view sitting here a week ahead of everything. Um, uh, apart from that, though, it's all been five under, but, you know, it's all weather. And we say it's about coastal golf. You know, it wouldn't matter if it was the Scottish Open this week, a kind of renaissance, which is as man-made as you'll ever get. Um, if that was blowing 35, 40 miles an hour up in the, on the Firth of Fourth this week, you wouldn't be seeing the scoring that we are going to see this week in terms of yep. they're just taking it apart. So, you know, it's one of those, especially if you've got DraftKings teams... Especially if you're built, if there's if there's one event that for me I don't like to get involved with anti post, and I wouldn't want to set my teams up way too early on DraftKings. It's the it's the Open mm. because it's so weather dependent, and you know you could see on a Wednesday that the weather's completely you know one eighted, and there's all of a sudden there's going to be a draw bias AM rather than PM or PM over the AM, and it could just absolutely screw with your bets and screw with your DraftKings teams. So it's it's one of those really. Um, my understanding is, uh, please correct me if we're wrong. If I'm wrong here, guys, I'm, I think it plays as a par seventy, yep. and the length I've got here is seven thousand one hundred eighty nine yards. Yeah, it's not overly long, is it? By no. uh, by any stretch. The fairways are fescue and bent grass. I'm going to me a Gronaby bit. The rough is fescue and bent grass. The greens themselves are forty percent bent grass. And sixty percent fescue, so it is a genuinely, yeah, it's just genuine links. When you're seeing sixty percent fescue on the greens, 
um, it's definite, um, definite Lynx territory. The only thing I'll say, and it's difficult to take a lot of information from one renewal because, you know, in-depth renewal what data-wise, we're looking at 2011, you don't get any strokes gain data because clearly strokes gain was just, um, it wasn't around in 2011. But I just look at some of the metrics that we saw on a very... I mean, I remember being there. It was pretty calm on the Thursday. Scoring was okay from memory. Um, was this? I think this is the um, this is the 2011 uh, renewal. Clearly Darren Clark won, but I can remember Lucas Glover being at the top of a leaderboard at some point. Mm. Thomas Bjorn and Tom Lewis were five under par 65 leaders on Thursday. They had then Glover, Jimenez and Webb Simpson, of all people, uh, at four under. And then I remember it clearly. We were there on the Friday, Paul, and it started off quite tranquil and sunny. And then all hell broke loose and there was wind. There were squally showers. There was plenty going on. Darren Clark and Lucas Glover were the leaders on Friday. And the, the, wind, the score had actually gone backwards to four under par. Uh, Thomas Bjorn, Chad Campbell, whatever happened to Chad Campbell, almost won the Masters. Mm. Miguel Angel Jimenez and Martin Keimer were tied for third place going into the weekend. From there, the weather didn't really get any better. Um, Friday was nasty, wet, rainy, very, very strong winds. And I think... I remember Peter Alice saying in the coverage for the Sunday, it was literally all seasons in one day. There was there were calm spells. There were spells when the sunshine was out and it was glorious. There was also tremendous rain and wind at certain parts. It was one of the most wind-affected um, majors that I can recall. I know that it's the Open. And then Darren Clark was masterful. Five under par winning. Um, we, he had a three-shot lit victory over American Raiders. Phil Mickelson and Dustin Johnson. Thomas Bjorn was in fourth. Chad Campbell, Anthony Kim, there's another great name, and Ricky Fowler were in the each-way places fit, uh, tied for fifth. And your old mucker, Paul, Raphael Jacqueline in eighth spot. Yeah, uh, yeah. That particular it's... week, we had four players under par, but I, I, I think it's all, this is all pretty meaningless, really. I don't think that's going to happen again this week. I did say to you, Paul, Phil Mickelson, Dustin Johnson, Ricky Fowler, even Sergio Garcia was in a tie for ninth. I'm also throwing into that mix Lucas Glover. That, to me, from an American comp course, don't shoot me down in flames, but it screams Beth Page Black outside of New York. There's, there's all of those players have done fantastically well around Beth Page. Now I know Beth Page isn't a coastal golf course, but what it is, it's a very tough golf course. Yes, yeah, that's the Clearly closest correlation, isn't it? it, it well, all, all of those names. I mean, U.S. Open 2009, Lucas Glover won it. Dustin Johnson was second in the PGA to Brooks Koepka a few years ago. Ricky Fowler, I think, as he was winning there one of the Barclays events and then went backwards, and Patrick Reed won it in, on the on the Sunday. Mm. There's a lot of... And Phil Mickelson's also got a fantastic... Uh, he was second at the um, Open that um, Glover won there in, in 09. I think he might, he might have also had another second. But anyway. All right, for Steve. What, dip for whatever in, reason, Beth Page. Dip into the memory banks there, Steve. What, what are the particular things players do really well when they're um, scoring well at Beth Page? Well, long, long, long approaches? Well, long off the tee... Definitely, it's a power course, isn't it, Beth Page? For me, it's a total driving golf course. Yeah. I mean, I remember when Brooks Kepka was taking, you know, he's basically the dog legs just going straight over the corners. And to me, that's a, it's a driver's golf course, Beth Page. And yes, it's a long course. So you've got to be good with your long to mid irons. So, yeah. I don't, I don't know. know. There, it, there might be something in there. It's difficult, isn't it? Because. Generally, there would have been very similar fields, so you can kind of see there's going to be a correlation in terms of some of the names up there. Um, mm. Yeah, I, I don't know. It's uh, in the fullness of time, we'll see if there's uh, there's some, some relevance in that or not. But uh, but yeah, it, it's a it's a tricky course, and I guess if if we were looking at a similar kind of um, 
you know, a marginally under par winning total, then you could infer that similar players with similar similar characteristics are going to be able to grind it out. But um, yeah, I yeah, don't know. We'll see. We'll see. That, also, that also shouts to me as well, Quail Hollow, where Thomas won the PGO. Yeah. Mickelson's got a fantastic record there. Lucas Glover's done well around there. D, um, so yeah, I'll have a little dig into it for today just to see if we can find any courses that really correlate across from an American perspective. Mm. But yeah, that was just something that literally slapped me in the front of the uh, forehead as soon as I started reading those names the other day. Who knows, eh? Mm. What are you looking for this week, Paul? You're you're in the actual chair, aren't you, in terms of the t- headline tips? Yeah. You're, the, you're our open guru. I think... Um... Well, similar to, to similar to the Masters, there are an awful lot of trends that you can dig into, which help you whittle the field down. And you, you can get bogged down with you know lopping people off your shortlist for some mm. historical trend, but they some of them really are quite uh, logical, and some of them are really quite uh, stark in terms of uh, how it differentiates the field. Um, and I, there's a the preview piece that you've put together, which is on the site now, which um, I'm sure we can link to in the uh, the yeah. pod description, goes through a number of these. But um, I've taken a few of the key points that you've put in that preview piece and kind of used it to to whittle the field down. So I'll take you through that because it gets. It, I, I think it is quite logical what some of these uh, some of these points, and I think it does get us to a relatively logical conclusion or kind of semi-conclusion, I guess, um, when you work through it. Um, the first point I've taken from your your preview is that the average open appearances from the last nine winners is 12 appearances, which means those players who are um, less experienced, debutants, those who've only turned up once or twice or um, you know, haven't, haven't had the experience of an open championship or open championship conditions are at a disadvantage. And I think there's logic to that. I think you need to be able to understand the the manner and the way in which you can play and succeed at an open championship. Uh, yeah. Looking through those winners, Spieth, Jordan Spieth was the player with the least appearances prior to winning. He had four. Yeah. Um, Ernie Els had 21. So the other end of the spectrum with Els. So I, I, don't, I don't think there's a... a um, a reason why you would exclude some of the players who've played a, you know, a large number of times because they've got an awful lot of experience in tough conditions. I think those guys really could come to the fore. But equally, those players who haven't played before or only have one or two um, the Open Championship appearances may well be uh, ones to to get uh, uh, to, to exclude from your list already. And some of the names, if you take all of the debutants out, and there are an awful lot of debutants, um, don't forget, we, we missed last year. So the last one we had was 2019. So there's a whole year's gap, effectively. <coughs> yeah, Morikawa, for, Morikawa won't have played an Open at all, will he? He hasn't, though. I mean, some no. of these names, I'll, I'll read through a few. That you, if, if, you, if you get as, um, as, uh, as specific as taking out players who played either one or no Open Championships, you'll lose players such as uh, Colin Morikawa, uh, Victor Hovland, Scotty Scheffler, um, your old mate Will Zalatoris, uh, yeah. Wolf, Burns, Higo, uh, Max Homer. You, no, no Homer bet this week, Barry. What are you going to do? Um, in terms of one performance, Neiman, uh, Corey Connors, uh, Christian who Bob McIntyre. I mean, he finished sixth on debut. But if you're getting as um, specific as taking out players that don't have a minimum of at least two, I mean, I, I, I've been quite generous here, and um, because Spieth was the uh, the win, winner, or, as I said, with uh, with four appearances. If you take out everyone who's got uh, less than two appearances, you are already down from this kind of embryonic field to ninety players from a starting point of over one hundred and fifty. And as I said, there's an awful lot of debutants in there as well. And uh, these, these big names are dropping uh, straight out of the list. Um, taking that a step further, 13 of the last 14 winners had an Open Championship top 10. I mean, Louis Oosthuizen was the exception here in 2010. Um, he arrived off the back of three missed cuts at the Open Championship and then then won. I, I guess, you know, looking back at that Open, that was the one at St Andrews, wasn't it, where there was a, an incredible draw bias. Um, yeah. And Louis got absolutely the right side of that. Um, 
and turned an incoming uh, Open Championship form of miscut, miscut, miscut into a, into a win. And he won at what? 250 to 1, I'm going to say. 250, I think it was. Late, he, he, he was late early, wasn't he? And he was right, mm. in, the, right in a sweet spot. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. But uh, uh, take Louis out of the equation. I mean, even Shane Larry. Ch- Shane came um, in 2019. He came uh, to, to the uh, to the Open off the back of four consecutive missed cuts at his previous Open Championships. But he did have a ninth place finish. Um, yeah. And as I say, 13 of the last 14s had an Open top 10. So not only the experience of playing in an Open... Um, is a good indicator, but also having had a top ten finish. And again, if you take, if you get as uh, specific as taking out all of the players that don't have a top ten finish, then you'll lose the likes of John Rahm, who's best is eleventh, uh, Justin Thomas eleventh, Patrick Cantlay, who's best is twelfth, Bryson DeChambeau, awful record at the Open Championship, and his best is fifty first. Uh, English Simpson, Berger, Matt Fitz, all of these players will drop out if you exclude everyone who doesn't have a top 10 at the Open. Um, and I make that, you would automatically straight down to 38 players on your shortlist if you just take out those two factors. Which, oh, wow. Um, That's crazy. Yeah. It, it, it start, you, you're starting to get to something a bit more manageable here. Um, the other point, and, and, and you, you, there's, there's quite a long section in the preview about um, current form, which is quite right, because if you look back at these previous winners... Um, going back to 2010, every winner had a top three finish in one of their last seven starts, coming in with some kind of um, positive form and you know contending form over the last few weeks and months seems to be an absolute must. And again, I don't, I don't think you just rock up at an Open Championship off the back of no form and uh, and, and find a way to go over the line. No. Um, and again, if you if you push out. Again, top three, maybe, maybe that's a bit specific. I've pushed it out to top five. If you if you if you're going to say, well, players need to have had a top five finish in their last seven eight starts, you're losing the likes of Brant Schnedeker, um, Justin Rose, uh, Tony Finau hasn't had a top five finish for a while. Uh, Ricky Fowler, no, Barry, that's that's going to put a uh, damper on some of your, uh, your your bets for the week as well, isn't it? Ricky Fowler dropping out of that stage. Uh, Dustin Johnson, Jason Day. Well, I was yeah, going to but... say, I'm just looking at Dustin Johnson. 25th, 19th, 10th, missed cut, 48th, 13th, missed cut of the Masters. Yeah. You know, that, that to me isn't the form of an open championship winner who's sitting there third in the market, 16 to 1. In fact, he's as short as 11 to 1 with Unibet. You know, that's mm-hmm. just a terrible bet. Yeah, yes, in the interesting trends here, aren't they? They are, they, they are, and, and I, th- I think current form is fairly critical. I, again, taking that to the nth degree, um, fourteen of the last twenty winners had already won a title of some description in that calendar year today. Yeah. So uh, Shane yeah. had won in Abu Dhabi right yeah. at the start of the year, the Rolex Series event. Uh, Francesco Molinari had won at Wentworth um, a few weeks before. Uh, Jordan Spieth had won the Travellers. Uh, Henrik Stenson had won the BMW International over on the uh, European Tour in Germany um, a few weeks before as well. So the last four winners all came in with um, with solid uh, winning form recently. And again, if you take out all of the players that haven't got a win this year so far, you'll lose the likes of Xander, um, which uh, well documented when, and well discussed that Xander hasn't had, had a win for a while. Uh, Louis Oosthuizen. Now, Louis is going to be incredibly popular this week. He's coming off the back of, what, two consecutive second-place finishes at Opens? Or he's had, he's had two this year in, in any in any way. So he's going to be popular. Um, a Open Championship winner of the past, but he doesn't have that, doesn't have that recent win. Uh, Shane Lowry's not won since his uh, Open Championship win in 2019. Martin Keimer, which we've discussed, who we've discussed ad nauseum on the podcast, hasn't won. Tommy Fleetwood, who's been off the uh, off the boil. Although he, again, Tommy showed a little bit in uh, in Scotland yesterday, and again, you know, it doesn't take much for um, for players to 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 appear on uh, betting slips and uh, in, in people's lineups um, as soon as they start to show a bit of form like that. And Tommy's always a popular player, so. Yeah, again, if you take all of those out, take the current form aspects out, take the um, win in 2021 out, and that takes you down to a list of just 11 players. And I think that's 11 quite managed. players? Yeah. Oh, now, I, can, we... I, can, I can hear our listeners saying, Paul, please, what? who are those 11 players, Paul? 
<laughs> the, I can the hear 11. them. They're, they're coming. It's coming through the walls of the office. Please, this Paul, is it. tell us who are the who's this, the golden this, eleven. This is the chance, Paul. Set up a Patreon. <laughs> So yeah, pe- pe- pens it, and pens is it going to be ten, ten quid, or what, what are we charge him? Uh, qu- <laughs> well, one quid, one quid per player, eleven. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, and, 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 in, in the post analysis, it will be interesting to see if the winner does come out of this list of eleven. But I'll read, I'll read them through in current world ranking order. Um, Brooks Kepka, Patrick Reed, Rory McIlroy, Tyrrell Hatton, Hideki Matsuyama, Paul Casey, Jordan Spieth. Phil Mickelson, Mark Leishman, Stuart Sink, and uh, Brandon Grace is number eleven. And there's some, you know, I, I look at that list, and I'm, I'm not uncomfortable with um, many of the names on there. Many of the names would actually be ones that you could quite see um, going well at an Open Championship. Mark Leishman, Mark Leishman came into my mind yesterday afternoon. Because he, he finished like a train at the Travellers, didn't he, last time out? He yep. finished second. Yeah, that's yep. right, third, yeah. I, f- I fell into the Leishman trap the uh, in 2019. I got all big on Leishman and chose the wrong... Con- I was kind of have Leishman and Larry sort of in my head as similar guys. I don't know why, just maybe just the way they hit the ball or something like that, but I always had them together and uh, I chose Leishman completely. We all overlooked Larry. He was amazing. Everybody got Rory focused, but um, I I think I've kind of lost the Leishman love after just, I can't seem to catch him at the right time. The and thing with Le- there's times the thing where you with- expect him to win and he doesn't. You're like, God, mm. you know. The thing with Leishman, Barry, I don't know if you, for me, the weakest part of his game is his driving. I'm just looking at his numbers from the Travellers. Third for strokes gained off the tee at the Travellers, which was his best driving performance since 2020 Sony Open. And then, you listen to this. 2020 Sony Open, he was second for strokes gained off the tee and he finished 28th. He then went to his beloved Torrey Pines the w- two weeks later and won the Farmers Insurance Open. He was third for off the tee, eleventh tee to green, ninth for putting at the Travellers, and he's sixty-six to one for the Open. He's yeah. got a couple of top tens as well, hasn't he? From memory, at the Open, yeah, he has. Yeah, yeah, was yeah. one up at Liverpool, he fifth was, or sixth, something like that. And I, he, did, players, he, he made the playoff at St Andrews with Zach Johnson, didn't he? And Jason did, yeah. Day, twenty fifteen. That's right. Yeah, wow. he's one of those players that you. Um, you know, I, I, I've regularly considered for um, major championships in in general, but the Open Championship would be would seem to be the one that does uh, does lend itself best to mm. him. And, um, yeah, he's, he, very he's, interesting. He's got uh, he's got got some winning form this year. It was the um, it was it the pairs event that he won. I forget, forget exactly. Yeah, he won it with Cam Smith down in Louisiana. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Um, Are you counting that as a win? Oh, well, come on. Barry. I, <laughs> It's a two-year <laughs> exemption on the PJ Tour, so he's <laughs> got to, isn't he? Yeah. I, it, the, the criteria was as loose as a win of any description. In the, yeah, in, yeah. In he was also Italian fifth. At, he was also fifth at the Masters, so he's he's got a recent major top ten about him as well. And when you ever you, I mean, I, I only follow him on the PJ Tour, but you you know when you look at coastal events, two-time winner at Torrey, yeah, not two. He's, he's won at Torrey Pines. He's like three second places there. His his form by the coast, Sony Open, Kapalua. He's always a coastal positive player, Mark Leishman. Yeah. And yeah. because he's Australian, he, he played a lot of his golf around you know Victoria and a lot of coastal golf courses. So yeah, I like that. I like that a lot. Can't be said. Yeah, so, I, two or three names within that. I mean, um, Hideki Matsuyama had to pull out of um, the Detroit event with COVID, didn't he? So he's in the shortlist, but. Uh, uh, you know, remains to be seen how that will or won't affect him coming into this. Um, he's got the he's got the top ten of the open in the past, so it's not. You know, I don't think we should assume or exclude him on the basis of it potentially not fitting an open championship uh, for his style of play. Rory, uh, I don't know. Again, it still seems like work in progress to me at the moment, but um, you know, it could, could could be uh, could be proven wrong. What about the, lefty? The, I, the thing about Rory is, it's always going to be a work in progress until he just pops and wins. Mm. It'll. I don't. I. I. I this. Uh, this time round, it feels like he's not going to telegraph it massively. It'll just bang win, um, yeah. and, and that's. It, it'll just click for him. 
you know, he's so, he in his early years, he was always so like hot or cold, you know, he was either on or he's off. And now he seems to, he's achieved that kind of level of his B game is usually, is very good. And then, you know, he'll have a top 10 and everyone's saying you're playing awful, but he's like, he's had a top 10. So I, yeah. I don't know. I mean, Rory will be questioned until he's not questioned when, with his next win. And then two days later, they'll be talking about why he hasn't won recently. <laughs> you know, when's he going to win again? So it's, I have Rory at, uh, what is he, 12s, 12s? Well, this is it, yeah. It's, um, it's, it's an it's, awful price. It's, um, you expect some of the prices will start to move around a little bit as of today, as of Friday, um, before as some of the bookies start to push out their final stance and their final markets for the uh, for the Open. Because we're still in this anti-post territory with most of them at the moment and mm. some of the pricing and some of the, the market isn't particularly attractive um, from what I from the position I look at it at. But yeah, 12 to 1, I don't think you'll get much more. You might get 14s, I suppose, something like that. But um, yeah, he's a tough one for me. If I was looking right now between Rory McIlroy at 12 to 1 and Brooks Kepka at 16 to 1, um, it wouldn't even be a conversation. It's, um, it'd be an automatic Brooks Kepka bet for me if it was between just the two of them. I've just been sitting here doing some basic maths, which is my one. Um, Average winning price of the Open over the last 11 renewal, so 2010 through... Uh, what am I talking about? See, I've got this wrong. I've got it wrong because I've done the wrong division. Let me do the right division. Because I, yeah. I was thinking that we are in 2021 and there was... 11. Oh, yeah, yeah. The, the, the 20, 80, 20, yeah. 81 to 1, the average winning price of the Open since 2010. Oh, that's yeah. the kind of that's the kind of price point I could really get excited about. Let's just scroll Lowry, down. Oh, Lowry seventy here. to one, Molinari thirty three to one. Spieth was the sixteen to one favourite. How open was that? Thirty to one Stenson, one hundred and twenty five to one Zach Johnson. Those are the last five. Mm. Yeah, and the outliers kind of push out that average a little bit. And then, yeah, you, you've got 250 with Oosthaus and 200 with Clark early doors, 45 with Elds, 20 with Mickelson, 18 to 1, Rory McIlroy, 2014. All averages yeah, through, 81 to 1. So if you take out the two wild ones, we're down to about 60 to 1, maybe yeah, 50, yeah, I 50 to 60 to 1. So. so it's Mark Leishman then, yeah? 66s. Oh, damn it, I just made your case for you. I don't believe it. <laughs> what about Brandon Grace, Paul? He's 66 to 1 as well. He, he's won this year, isn't he, down in Puerto Rico? He has won in the, this year. He's coming in the back of form of fourth and seventh. Um, he was sixth in the Open, what, three, four years ago? Um, 66 to 1. Yeah. I, I, is he again, on, but if, he's not on the list. Why is he not on the no, list? He, no, he's, no, Steve, he was on the he list. Is on he is on the list. He was 11 of 11, yeah. He, oh, he's, wow. he's definitely on the short list. Um, if you're going to get as specific, and again, one of the points that you made in the um, in the preview was that 18 of the last 20 winners were in the top top 55 in the world. Well, Grace currently sits 61st. So if you wanted to get as you know, again, as specific as taking out the top anyone outside the top 55, then the only player you would lose is Brandon Grace. I'm not going to take Brandon Grace off of my shortlist because no, he's Lord 61st on. rather than 55th. That's the, Especially the, the, when he's been he's been in the mix at both the PGA Championship where he led Dinny for a period yeah. and he was also right in the mix at the US Open. So it's not as if he's coming from nowhere with his major performances this year. I mean, he was 7th at the US Open. So you can't yeah. get rid of him for a world ranking that's five five spots too, high, too low. No. Uh, I, I, I think I'd struggle to get rid of Brandon Grace off my list full stop, to be so honest. So you can build a very strong mid-card of prices here, can't you? That have mm. actually got real chances of winning it, historically. Yeah. He was yeah. first for T to green at the US Open. Wow. That's good, crazy. solid signs from Brandon Grace, yeah. It's got to be said. I'll never forget him at Chambers Bay. He had no. it. It was his for the taking. And he banged it over the railway line. This is the short mm. par four, wasn't it? There's been a few yeah. short, short par fours for Grace that have uh, scuppered him right at the business end of um, the tournaments and majors in particular. But he's been close, hasn't he? He's he, he has got me licking. You've got me licking my chops here, Paul. <laughs> I think a lot of the a lot of the majors this year have been very unclear. And Barry, I remember you saying it in a lot of the research podcasts that it's like oh, it's not as clear cut as it usually is. This one, there seems to be some very strong indicators already. Mm. 
Yeah, you feel like you can get a very permanent marker through a lot of names. Yeah. And yeah, just, big and, names too. Yeah, and help the deci- help just at least help you make your decision process a little less hair pulling. Yeah, yeah. No, it's a very good point. What well, and Lefty's on this uh, short list as well. What what you what do you guys think of his chances in general? You know, recent major winner. You know. I think if the wind was going to be a severe factor, he'd be right in the mix. But it doesn't. It's going to be too calm. I think. Mm. It's coming up in, in, in the back of form of 60, 62nd, 61st, 74th. So um, I think it's fair to say he's been dining out on his. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but he, but he won the PGA off form of miscut yeah. 69th. So he, 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 but mm. the one thing he did do at the Rocket Mortgage in Detroit last week was drive the ball well. He was ninth for strokes gained off the tee, but the rest of the game was garbage. But. If it was one, going to be one of these really nasty 2011 jobs where he actually got in the mix, you might fancy a bit of Phil Mickelson, but I think it's going to be a bit. Do you think it'll be a bit, a bit too, more... yeah, too easy almost? Like not enough of a challenge to really focus him in? Yeah. That's what, yeah. When you read the interviews with Phil, he loves it when it's blowing 30 miles an hour and it's all about ball flight and guts and short game. Don't think it's going to be this like that this year. No. Well, no. at least not at least not one week out. Let's see what uh, the Atlantic brings yeah. in terms of weather. Yeah, mm. I, that's um, in terms of the trends. That's kind of where it leads me to. But I think it does allow you to again, if you get um, if you go down to the nth degree and uh, and, and really quite um, quite brutal on how you uh, how you remove players from the list. Because don't, yeah, don't forget, I've taken John Rahm off that list because he finished. He's got a best of eleventh at the Open Championship, um, and it's this top ten uh, finish. But that that eleventh could easily have been a top ten, couldn't it? And then it could be a horrible mistake in taking taking John Rahm, who's the current favourite for the tournament, out of the uh, out of the equation. And and, I, uh, and who's going to win the Scottish Open this week? Well, yeah. So exactly. what what, pro- what price are you going to be when he wins the Scottish Open this week? Yeah. Eight, seven to one, maybe. I mean, was, was he hovering around about nine to one at the moment? He's he? nine's biggest now at the moment. What do you reckon? So if he wins, what do you reckon? 30, 15 to two? Yeah, I, I, he won't be any better than eights, I don't think. So, yeah, it's... Um, I don't know. I, I, I'm not even sure he needs to win. I think if he comes in with the top five and, and shows everyone enough form, because it's only the rust factor that you're kind of assuming that's not quite there, but... From what I saw yesterday, from watching bits of the Scottish Open, there was there was no rust there. He was looking very, very good. I saw him on the first tee. He looked absolutely amped straight yeah. off the. There was no smoke. It was like he was there for business. Yeah, it was very impressive. Yeah. Shall I just run through some strokes gained um, trends as well before we we close the pod? Go for it. I had a look at you know last eight weeks. This is clearly not going to include the John Deere Classic or the Scottish Open, but it goes back to the PGA. For me, I think uh, just looking at Darren Clark, looking at Dustin Johnson, Fowler, what they did in 2011 around here, and just looking at the leaderboard, there are a lot of big hitters. I mean, driving distance over the Mickelson, DJ and Darren Clark. They averaged out. They were it was fifteenth um, longest in the field between those three. Driving accuracy fourteenth, greens and regulation fourth, scrambling fortieth, putting average sixteenth. I think, especially when you look at Greg Norman winning around here, who at his time was probably the longest on the golf course in terms of his power. I think there's something here about players that y- y- you can elicit a score with a little bit of accurate or booming power. So strokes going off the tee, top five last eight weeks on the you know across European and PGA Tour combined. John Rahm at one, DeChambeau two, Xander at three, and then we've got a tie in fourth. Cantlay and Morikawa. I don't think Cantlay's got a lot of Open Championship experience, has he? But he's playing no. some great golf at the moment. If you then next, you know, take that out to the top ten, Bubba. Bubba's playing some awesome golf, isn't he? But I wouldn't like to see Bubba in... Could you see Bubba in contention, doing a Bubba on down the back? Bubba, Bubba just... I don't know. Just, whenever he comes over to play the Open, he's, he's kind of a defeated man before he tees it up on the first uh, 
the first he's part half, of isn't he? He's part of the Bobble Hat Brigade, isn't he? Yeah, he's literally. It's like he, he's, he's it's like he's on a trip to the North Pole before he even kind of gets on the golf course. <laughs> It'd be like the Bahamas when he's here and it's eighteen degrees next week and sunny. Uh, well, that's far too cold for for those for most of the PJ <laughs> to eighteen. That's the middle of the winter. Bubba at six. Then you have got Fitzpatrick, who's been playing some nice stuff recently, and yeah. Kepka, Corey Connors, and Daniel Van Tonda for some bizarre reason. But anyway, he's in there. Um. And I was just looking at strokes gain tee to green as well. Top 10 last uh, over the last eight weeks. Here's some names for you. There's a tie for uh, ninth. Guido, Bernd Wiesberger and Shane Lowry. Who's, Shane's been playing some fantastic stuff. Um, eight is Jordan Spieth, which surprised me. I thought Spieth's tee to green game had fallen away recently. Seven, Matsuama. Six, Matthias Swab. Five, Brooks Kepka. Four, Patrick Cantlay. Three, John Rahm. Two, Colin Morikawa. And I guarantee you guys can tell me who's number one. T to green, last eight weeks. Don't The, ne- the nemesis. <laughs> Paul Casey. Paul Casey. Paul oh, Casey, no. number one. Oh, Steve, don't. Don't. Could no, no, just, uh, I mean, these are stats. <laughs> these aren't my opinion. And then I'll just take you through. Uh, <laughs> strokes gain current form last eight weeks. Again, this is out without the Scottish, without the John Deere Classic. Jason Day at 10. Kepka at 9. Richard Bland at 8. Now, I'm doing some long shots, and Richard Bland continues to play out of his skin. 7 is Spieth. 6 is Louis, of course. Louis Oosthuizen, who does a lot of his work with the putter. Um, five, a tie for fourth, Cantley and Casey, Morikara at three, Guido at two, and John Rahm, number one. Just some players that are playing some great golf at the moment. Paul Casey, he, he was again, he was one of the um, one of the players on that final shortlist. To take, like looking at Casey in the open though, he of his last six attempts at it, he has 11th, and his next best result is 47th. Mm. Three other made cuts and one missed cut. And then the two appearances before that were a missed cut and a 54th. So you have to go all the way back to 2010 for him to be to have a top 10 in the Open. One thing I will say, Paul, just I'm, I'm saying this to you as well. I've just gone back to 2015. Zach Johnson was third for tee to green on his previous outing. Jordan yeah. Spieth was first. Frankie Molinari was fourth. You can't say the same with Shane. He was 30th. But you go a um, couple of... He finished not, second at the Canadian Open, three outings before he won the Open. And he was ninth for tee to green, third for putting. So there's a lot... In, I mean, what I'm saying here is these trends mean nothing really. A, a Mark Leishman or a Brandon Grace fit into the trend, don't they, in terms of they were absolutely bang on it from T to green, the outing before they won. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Grace is playing the Scottish Open, so we, and he's playing well again. Isn't he? Three under through the first 18? Yeah, solid under. enough. So solid enough. There's some really interesting, fascinating trends, I think, to follow for this, potentially. It's exciting, really. Yep. Put it all together, see where uh, see see where it all comes to. I, we've, we've got the Scottish Open to to really dig into, and you know it looks like there's going to be some big names and big contenders who um, are going to you know are going to raise their head above the parapet this uh, this weekend. And Justin Thomas is another one who hasn't been showing much recently yet. Put a very strong round together yesterday in the, in Scotland, and if he continues to put that together, then his price is going to get uh, going to get significantly uh, reduced from the current 22 to 1 you could, you could see him going off at 18 16s if he continues to hang about at that kind of level because I, I really hope he does because that'll push other prices out yeah yeah i no, I, 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 I i no, no matter what thomas does this week i couldn't be you couldn't get me to back him at the, <laughs> especially at the price he's at it's it's it was only his putting, wasn't it? And um, I, I mentioned briefly in the podcast earlier this week that there had been just a very small sign that his putting had started to improve on his last outing, and um, perhaps he's found the solution. You know, and and just, Justin Thomas isn't a bad putter. Justin Thomas is an incredible putter when he's on his game, but he's just completely off the boil with a flat stick, or had been. Um, 
but when that turns, his long game, um, his, his ball striking recently have been absolutely top notch. So um, potentially a danger. We record, we're recording this early Friday morning over in the UK. We already have a situation where Boyle Sports has switched on their real um, Open Championship market. They have gone 10 places each way at the Open. Uh, we also have a situation where William Hill have also gone live with their real market. They switched off the anti-post market. William Hill, as is their one, have gone nine places each way of 50 odds for the Open this week. I expect that Paddy Power stroke Betfair will go will switch on their 10 places each way, which they tend to do for the majors today, Friday. Yeah. So you so going into the weekend prior to the open, you're going to probably have four or five of the bookmakers that have got their real markets out and their each way place proposition in place. Mm. Which I don't I don't rec- it's getting earlier and earlier, which is great, but yeah, fair play to Boyle Sports and fair play to William Hill for going so early. Yep, yeah, yeah, they've shown their hand. Although they've both been really quite consistent. In fact, a lot of the bookers have been consistent in each of the majors over the last uh, last year, haven't they? So you can kind of preempt and predict where some of these bookies are going to go. Um, it's just a case of sitting tight and waiting for them to come up. Um, if the player that you fancy is the right price or the right terms, then uh, away you go. And, and hold a few bullets until Wednesday night. <clears throat> Because if the weather the weather could be switching right up until that point, and you could like like you said earlier, Steve, you could see a draw bias um, become very apparent at the very last minute. Mm. Potentially, Paul and I have already. Um, I've got my because we've had no summer at all, but virtually we, we've all, we've unpacked the um, the shorts for next week. Paul's been telling me for about four <laughs> four months that this is the week that summer comes to the UK. A fleeting summer. We might we might get a, a week, ten days. Of, we tend uh, to get warmth. ten to twelve days per summer of good weather in the UK. So apparently, four or five of them are next week. Paul's been telling me forever. So I've even got the sun lotion now. <laughs> factor fifty at the ready. Steve. The factor fifty's out. So I, I'm expecting good scoring conditions in Kent. Mm, yeah, but clearly most of the Americans will still be wearing their bobble hats in our <sighs> peak of summer. I, th- I think it'll be like a breath of free. You know, temperatures potentially up to the uh, low 20s, so 70, 75 degrees centigrade Fahrenheit next week. Um, sunny. Yeah, but the wind chill, the wind chill, bobble hats. <laughs> I'd love I'd love an over under like prop bet on bobble hats, like just oh, <laughs> one of those yeah. crazy markets. Well, <laughs> now that Kevin Nars not coming across because he can't get across from America, there's travel restrictions apparently. Mm. So I don't know how the rest of the field have got across, but anyway. Kevin Kevin's taking the bubble hat number down by one, isn't he? Um, so that that's a bit of a shame. Are there any players, longer price players, Barry? Before we, before we disappear, the, any names that in the market that have taken your view? I thought it was interesting. Ryan Palmer fired a nice low score yesterday in Scotland on an easy soft golf course. That, that that is interesting, but he's not winning the open. No, he's not next week, Steve. I, I, don't, I don't. I don't think, think yeah. he's finishing in the top ten either for an each way punt. No. Anyone that interests you at uh, uh, any kind of price? Because one thing I will say here, I'll just read this out. I mean, I'm I'm taking last year's uh, 2019's open. Westwood was 110 to one. He placed. Tyrrell Hatton was 90 to one. Believe it or not, Robert McIntyre was 200 to one. Danny Willett, 125 to 1. These were all each way places. The year before that, Xander Schofley was 110 to 1, finishing second. Kevin Kisner was 300 to 1. Kevin Chappell, 250 to 1. Eddie Pepper, 175 to 1. So you are getting triple digit players in the mix every single year at the Open. Mm. As ever. It's just a case of picking the right one. I mean, JB Holmes, 200 to 1 the year that Stenson and Mickelson had their uh, shootout. Was it true in 2016, I think? Mm-hmm. Um, Holmes was 200 to 1. Steve Stricker was 250 to 1. Tyrrell Hatton, 175 to 1. It's just, I mean, I, I'm picking some of these. I'm, I'm picking the longer shots. It's just, I, I, I'm trying to get my head around who might interest me this week. Kevin Kisner might be one. He's playing some better could, stuff, isn't he? Could be, yeah. 
hundred and fifty to one Kevin Kisner across the that's, board. That's going to have my attention if I can see ten, eleven places for sure. Like, there's there's no way I don't back that. But like, just uh, to state the obvious. Yeah, mm. well, this is the point, though, isn't it? It's making those decisions and conclusions right now when the markets aren't complete is um, yeah difficult. Isn't it? Yeah, it is. Yeah, I mean, Guido. Um, what was he fourth? Is uh, made a uh, major championship start a couple of weeks back. One hundred and fifty to one. I mean, look, Patrick Harrington is showing plenty of good form. Like lots of it, he's gone mm. well in Scotland. But you know, the last few weeks has been kind of eye catching. Um, he's seen Richard Bland win recently. He saw Phil win the the last mate. You know. The last major, like, well, he top five at the things. PGA, didn't he? With Shane, Did so yeah, it's like, not as if he hasn't been in the mix in the major recently, is it? By the case, I mean, that, that, and that's like that's even if he doesn't go well, it's still a bet you could be ha- like just it's fun to be on. And right now, I'm seeing prices up to two hundred to one with the you know the really short places, but for the extended places, you can you're probably looking at one fifty, one seventy five, maybe somebody. Will yeah, take what one seventy five with William. 175 with William Hill on those nine places. Yeah, so if we can get 175, 10 or 11 places, like I'm not going to be able to resist that either. Yeah, and if the conditions do deteriorate, then you know, this the kind of player who could uh, come through. Find a way. Mm. Plenty to ponder. That, that is the open in a nutshell, though. You've, we've mentioned there two players, Kisner from an American perspective and Harrington from a European perspective, that are grinders. Mm. Have, and clearly, Harrington, a two time winner. May, three-time major winner, Kisner's got finished second in a in a in a um, Open Championship, and you're picking him up at crazy prices. Meanwhile, you know you've got Bryson DeChambeau, who's got, you know, I, I wouldn't be backing Bryson DeChambeau at Sandwich twenty-five to one. I suppose that's kind of a lot bigger than he has been. The one thing that I always remember about arriving at Sandwich, it was like almost like a moonscape. It was like a golf course I'd never seen before my own eyes. And I think, like you said, Paul, that's going to come out with a lot of the guys that are inexperienced at genuine Open Championships. Yeah. They'll arrive, they go, what is this place all about? Mm. <laughs> yeah, proper links. Mm. Interesting. Is that us then, chaps? Should we uh, leave it at that? Yep, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll reconvene what, Monday evening, most likely, to talk through our final picks and uh, then look forward to next next week's main event. Absolutely. If you've got any questions, listeners, just fire out fire out a um, a tweet to any of us, and we'll we'll pick it up. If you've got any questions in the intervening period over the weekend, fire out a tweet to any of us, and we'll get back to you with a, a group consensus on it. Um, yes, I think we're going to be recording the pod early this next week. Oh, we Monday potentially, so it could be. Um, just keep your eye on your devices. You might find that as of Monday, the uh, the the actual tips podcast will be out there for you to uh, to listen to. So keep your eyes and ears out for that one. Um, that's it then, isn't it? Um, I hope you enjoy your Open Championship research over the weekend. Um, Paul's going to be busily pulling his preview together. I'm doing some long shots. There'll be some first-round leader bets, I expect. I might throw a couple of couple of stakes at the Barbasol Championship as well, which is the alternate event on the P- on the uh, PJ Tour next week. Also, I just hope that um, the bets that you've got left at the Scottish Open and the John Deere Classic go well for you over the weekend. And we will see you again very, very soon for our Open Championship Tips podcast. Thanks for your time, gents. Cheers. Take care. Cheers. And we'll see you next week. Goodbye. If you like betting on golf but everyone that you back misses the cut Get some experts involved With all the stats and the tips and so much more Cause it's the golf betting system The golf betting system is the golf betting system